Okay, so today is the last section, last lecture of the Markov chain theory. So so far, I mainly discussed the upper bound for the mixing time. So in the second lecture, I mentioned the yeah, I mentioned the theory of coupling to prove that Markov chain mixes fast. And last time I mentioned the spectral method, so using the eigenvalue information, how can we prove that? Yeah, Markov chain mixes fast, right? And today, <coughs> and today, I will sh I will give you some methods to prove the opposite direction. So how to show that Markov chain mixes slowly? Okay. So the last part is about the lower bound. <coughs> Lower bound for the mixing time. Okay. Yeah. So methods are, method is very different from the previous ones. Okay. So I'll define a notion of bottleneck ratio. So this is a new notion. Notion so. I will emphasize this. So we take a set, so we have a total set omega, okay? And we take a subset S, right? So we have S and S complement, okay? So I will measure how I will measure some kind of shape of this set. So So this is called bottleneck ratio of the set. Okay. So what does this mean? Bottleneck. Bottle bottleneck is this, right? Like this. This shape, right? And this is called some kind of bottleneck, right? Okay. So bottleneck ratio of the set measures this portion of the set. So mathematically, this is defined as pi s is defined by, so we take a point in s and point in s complement. So we pick one point inside the set and outside this set, okay? And then measure the transition color, okay? So we have pi x, p, x, y, and we take some normalization, okay? And as before, pi is invariant measure, okay? So pi is invariant distribution. Okay. Yeah, so this is called the bottleneck ratio of the set and this <coughs> this measures this kind of shape of the set so for example if this quantity is very very small then one can say that oh there is a, some kind of thin part of inside the set okay so why so <coughs> so yeah for example yeah and uh, yeah so if you take the minimum of this value among all sets, then this is called, so we take the minimum of this value for all set, okay, whose mass is less than one half, then this is called isoperimetric constant. Okay, so this is exactly the so I think you heard about this before in in differential geometry class, right? So this isoperimetric constant is the probable Markov chain analog of isoper isoperimetric constant in differential geometry. So they have very similar meaning. So why why do we call this isoperimetric constant? So there is an intuition. So for example, let's consider a simple random walk on the graph. Okay, so let's think about this graph. Okay, we have a graph and take a simple random walk, right? 
and I want to compute this bottleneck ratio. Okay, so what is the bottleneck ratio of the simple random walk? So, yeah. So what is this? Okay. So let's pick this set S. Okay. So this is S. Okay. So this is S, and this set is complement, right? So this is complement, <clears throat> and I want to measure the bottleneck ratio of this set. Okay. Yeah. So what does this mean intuitively? So let's use this equation. Okay. So this is pi s. Okay. And numerator is sigma x in s, y outside s, okay? <clears throat> and then we compute the transition corner. But what is the transition corner of simple random walk? So what is this? P, x, y is what? So what is the transition rate? So what is the rate if x and y are not connected? If x and y are not connected, then? P is 0, right? Because x cannot go to y. Okay, so this is obvious. If x is not connected to y. But if x is connected to y, connected to y, then what is the probability that x jumps to y? 1 over degree. Great. So there are so yeah, degree of x many connected vertices, right? So we choose one of them. So probability is 1 over degree. So we have this, right? So P X Y is one over degree, right? One over degree. Okay. But we have to be careful because X and Y should be connected, right? So X and Y should be connected. So we should put one more condition. So this is X in S, Y in S complement, but x and y should be connected, right? So we should put one more condition. So we have x is connected to y, right? Otherwise, p is 0, right? Okay. And what is the invariant distribution of the simple random walk on graph? What is the invariant measure? So, so this is the kernel. This is a transition corner. And what is the invariant measure of the simple random walk? This is degree. This is proportional to degree. Okay. Yeah, so you can easily check that this is, in fact, this is reversible because pi x times pxy is, so there is a cancellation. So it is 1 over two times number of edges, right? So pi x times p x y is equal to pi y p y x. So the equation is satisfied. So in fact, this measure is always reversible and invariant, right? So let's put this formula into here. So what do we get? This times degree x divided by two times number of edges, okay? So let's compute this. What do we get? So degree, degree cancel out, okay? Degree, degree cancel out. So what do we get? The final answer is, okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's, mm, okay. So one over two times number of edges times, so pi s is, so let's put this in here, then we get, denominator is summation degree of x for x inside s times uh, divided by 2 times e. But there is a cancellation here, right? So we, sh we can delete this. Okay. So there is this term, right? And numerator is x in s y outside s, x, y connected, one. Okay. 
So I will just, yeah. So this is just the number of elements in this set, right? Okay. So this. So numerator is just size of this set. But what does this mean? So we should pick one element in this orange set, and we pick the second element in the yellow set, but orange one and yellow one should be connected. So what does this mean? So what's the example of this set? So we pick one point from each set, but they should be connected, right? So like this. This, okay, right? This, okay. This, okay, right? So we have how many candidates? So is that all? Maybe, uh, yes, right? So that's all, right? So this is exactly some kind of boundary of this. Set. So this is some kind of boundary of the set, okay? So what does boundary of the set mean? Boundary means that boundary of the set describes this kind of blue blue edges. Okay? Therefore, the conclusion is that isoperimetric constant of the set equals boundary divided by Fourier of the set. Okay? So this is the reason why this constant is same as the isoper isoperimetric constant in differential geometry, right? So in differential geometry, we yeah, so we learned that isometric, isoperimetric constant is the yeah, length of the, yeah, so the volume of boundary divided by volume of the whole set, right? So this is exactly the same as that, right? Boundary divided by volume. So this is the reason and motivation why we call this constant by isoperimetric constant. Okay. So, mm -hmm. So I will give you some examples examples of the isoperimetric constant of the graph. Mm, yeah. Okay. So what is the isoperimetric constant of the lattice? Okay. So let's think about the lattice, two-dimensional lattice, and let's take this set. Let's take the set, size n. So we take n by n, okay? And what is the isoperimetric constant of this set? So if we think about a simple random walk on the n by n lattice, then what is pi? Pi is, any ideas? So roughly, approximately, size of boundary divided by size of volume. But what is the size of boundary? What's the boundary? Boundary is 4n, right? n, 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 4n. What's the volume? n squared. Of course, there's a degree, so degree is 4. So it is 4 times n squared, but uh, yeah, let's, yeah, we can ignore the constant. Constant is not important, so yeah. So isoperimetric constant is of order 1 over n. Okay. So, mm -hmm. But very different thing happens if we take a different type of graph. So this is second example. So instead of lattice, let's, let's take a binary tree. Binary tree. Okay. Right? Let's take a binary tree. And let's take the depth n. Okay? Depth is n. The depth is n, and take this set, and what is the isoperimetric constant of this set? Okay. So what is the size of boundary? So if you take depth n, then how many elements are present here? How many elements do you have? 2 to the n, right? This is binary, right? So what's the size of boundary? Boundary is 2 to the n, right? So this is just boundary, right? 2 to the n. But what is the volume? What is the size of this binary tree? 
2 to the n, 2 to the n minus 1, 2 to the n minus 2, 1. What summation is? 2 to the n plus 1, right? So up to constant 2 to the n. Yeah. So this is 1n. So it behaves very different from the lattice, right? So in the case of lattice, if we take, so, so if the size of lattice gets larger, then we get smaller isopendulous constant. But in the case of tree, whatever depth we take, we always get the similar isopendulous constant. So constant, this isopendulous constant is uniformly bounded in the size of graph. Whereas in the case of lattice, it decays to zero. So the summary here is that, so the the concept of isoparametric constant depends heavily on the underlying graph. So yeah, does it make sense? Okay. So why do I mention this? The reason is that this isoparametric constant, this this notion of isoparametric constant, gives the lower bound on the mixing time. So this is the main theorem. Theorem. Mixing time is always greater than 1 over 4 times isoparametric constant. Yeah. It gives the lower bound. So what does this mean? If isoparametric constant is very, very small, okay, so if pi star is close to zero, then this right hand side is a large number. Therefore, mixing time is very large. Mixing time being large means that Markov chain mixes slowly. So if we think about the simple random walk on the graph whose isoparametric constant is very, very small, then you will get a large mixing time. Okay? So this is a relation between isoparametric constant and mixing time. So this is intuitively true, right? So why? So what happens if isoparametric constant is small? So this, that means that compared to the volume, boundary is very, very small, right? So what happens? If compared to volume, if boundary is small, okay, then, right? So yeah, like this. So compared to the volume, suppose that the boundary here is very, very small then this means that it should take a longer time to, for this Markov chain to get mixed, right? So because the boundary part is very, very small, right? So this plays some kind of bottleneck, right? Bottleneck is an obstruction for the Markov chain to get mixed, right? Okay, okay so this is the main theorem of today's lecture, and I will prove yeah, I'll prove this. Okay. So proof proof is yeah, of course proof is not very easy here. But yeah, I will briefly give you a proof. So mm -hmm. so I will use a fact that so I will not prove this because this is a bit technical. So I will use a fact that so mm -hmm. we so let's take a set S, okay? S, and this is the whole set omega, okay? So I will take, so, so we fix a set S and measure the isoparametric constant of this set. So we will focus on this set. So let's take the conditional measure, okay? So here, pi is the reversible measure, and let's take the conditional measure. conditional measure, conditional distribution of the stationary measure pi on the set S. So originally, pi is defined on the whole set omega, right? In the whole set. But I will just condition on this, condition this distribution only on this set. So what does this mean? This means that this is nothing other than pi, so, 
So I will denote this measure by mu s. So mu s, hmm? mu s of the set is defined by pi a intersection s divided by pi s. So mu s is the probability distribution we are interested in. So we take the conditional distribution, so original measure, original property measure, but restrict only onto s. Okay? So this is a new probability distribution whose support is only s, not whole thing omega. Then, very useful fact is that, so this is, this is quite useful. So one can express isoperimetric constant of this set, of this purple set, in terms of this. So this is pi, uh, sorry, mu s transition corner minus mu s total variation. So I will not prove this, but I will use this fact. So what does this intuitively mean? So what's the meaning of this? Okay. So what's the meaning? So recall that if we if you recall the definition of pi of s, what does this mean? This means that so there's a summation in the numerator, right? So we pick one point in the set S and one point outside the set, and then we take the transition probability, right? We take the summation, right? So pi of s measures some kind of interaction between s and s complement, right? But what does this mean, right hand side? Okay. So mu s is the probability distribution defined only on this purple set, right? But what is this? Mu s transition, mu s times transition corner. So this is the distribution of the next time Markov chain, starting from this one, right? So there is some kind of spread, right? So, so the initial distribution is only defined on the set, but if we run a Markov chain for one time, then we this kind of distribution spread out, right? So the difference between this spread out thing and the original thing is some kind of isoperimetric constant. So intuitively, they are related, right? But if you recall the definition, right? So this measures some kind of interaction between this, and this also measures some kind of interaction between them. And it is, yeah, it is not hard to check that this is true. So I will accept, yeah, I will use this fact to prove, yeah, this theorem. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, now let's prove this. We let's use this and Let's measure mu s p t. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, instead of just time one Markov chain, let's measure the difference between time t Markov chain and the original set. Okay. So let's measure this. And what is this? So I want to bound this. And by triangle inequality for the total variation, by triangle. Triangle, right? And what is the last term? What is this? Last term is by that fact, this is isoperimetric constant of the set, right? But what is, what are the other terms? For example, what is what is the sec what is the second term? What is this? So this is u s p square minus u s p. Uh, but that's a bit delicate, but because, yeah, because, yeah, there is no version for p square minus p, but there we can use a useful fact, right? So in the second problem set, there was a problem, right? Like this, mu p minus mu p total variation is less than mu minus v 
total variation. So do you remember this? Second problem set, right? So let's use this. So this lemma says that for any two initial distributions, the total variation distance decreases along the Markov chain, along any Markov chain, right? So what is the bound for this? So one can say that second term, this term is less than this one, right? Using this fact. So this is less than pi s, right? And similarly, how about this term? Can we, yeah, we can also say that this is less than pi s because we know that total variation distance always decreases along the Markov chain, right? So what is the upper bound? So this is t times isoperimetry constant. Okay. Yeah, so we are almost done. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay, so this is the first ingredient and second ingredient. Second. Then now let's compute the difference between mu s and pi. Okay, let's measure this. So let's write down the definition of total variation. So what is the total variation distance? So this is supremum of measure on the set minus measure on the set, right? So this is the maximum of the difference, right? So this is obviously greater than mu s s complement minus pi s complement, right? Absolutely right. Okay. So we take S complement set, okay, and then measure the difference between these values. Okay. But what is the quantity here? What is the what is the measure of this conditioned measure outside the set? Zero, right? Because mu s is only defined on the set S, right? Outside this, there's no mass, right? So the first quantity is zero. Okay. This is zero. And what is this? So recall that, yeah, recall that this, def this definition is minimum of isoperimetric set over, only over pi s is less than one half. So this means that pi of s complement is greater than one half, right? Therefore, this quantity is greater than one half. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are done, right? We are almost done. So let's combine number one and number two. Number one means that mu s and mu s p t are quite close. There, there is an upper bound. But the second says that pi and mu, has, mu s are quite far away. This means that pi and mu s p t are also far away. So rigorously, the conclusion is that, so combining number one and number two, we get, therefore, so let's write down number two. So one half less than mu s minus pi. Okay. But by triangle, less than mu s minus mu s p t plus mu s p t minus pi. But we already know that this is less than t times pi s t pi s, okay, plus, yeah. So let's take t mix here. So let's take t mix. So t mix, t mix. So what is the definition of mixing time? Mixing time is the first time that total variation distance at time t and stationary measure becomes less than one quarter, right? So this is less than one quarter. So what's the conclusion? So there's a T mix. 
T mix. The conclusion is that, yeah, we are done. So if you, yeah, if you arrange this inequality, you will get that, right? T mix should be greater than one over four times isoperial constant. So yeah, any questions about the proof? Yeah, so this is a key idea. So of course, at the at the first time, it is very hard to hard to discover this identity. It is not given this identity. Yeah, it is not. It is easy to prove this identity, but it is hard to discover this identity. But yeah, if if we know some kind of relation between the isoperimetric constant and this kind of total variation distance, then proof is quite yeah straightforward. Of course, the, this statement is yes. This statement itself has a great importance. So yeah, any questions? Okay. Okay. So yeah, I will save this. But in the second lecture. I mentioned another lower bound for the mixing time using the spectral gap, right? So T mixing time is greater than maybe one over absolute spectral gap, right? So I mentioned that kind of inequality, right? So this theorem lower bounds the mixing time in terms of isoperimetric constant. And uh, in the second lecture, um, not second, yesterday? Uh, I forgot. Maybe yesterday, right? Uh, yeah, right. Yesterday. I mentioned this kind of inequality, right? P T mix is greater than maybe one over gamma star, right? One over spectrograph. Is this yesterday's lecture? Maybe? Oh, yeah, right? So both, uh, either isoperimetric constant or this kind of spectrograph gives the lower bound on the mixing time. But interestingly, there is a direct relation between isoperimetric constant and spectrograph. So there is a direct re relation. So this is second theorem. Okay. So if we additionally assume that pi is reversible, okay, then there is an interesting relation between spectral gap and isoperimetric constant. So this is a relation between them without referring to mixing time. So what is a spectral gap? Recall that spectral gap is difference between the true eigenvalue and second largest eigenvalue. So this theorem says that if yeah, spectral gap is roughly equal to Isoperimetric constant. They behave. They behave similarly. If one is small, then another one is small. If one is large, then then another one is large. Right. So yeah, we have this relation. I will not prove this because proof is quite complicated. But yeah, you should remember that there is a. They are closely related. They behave very similarly. Gap and isoperimetric constant. So in summary, if spectral gap or isoperimetric constant is large, then we have then Markov chain mixes fast. And if spectral gap or isoperimetric constant is small, then Markov chain mixes slowly. That's the conclusion. So yeah, does it make sense? Okay, so now I'll 
mention the last theorem, which gives another yeah, which gives another lower bound for the mixing thing. So this is the last theorem. Maybe this is fact, not theorem. So this is called distinguishing statistics method. So suppose that, yeah, so let's define the expectation of some function under the property measure mu. So this is very obvious, right? Okay. So what is the expect expected value of some observable or some statistics under the measure? It is just linear sum, linear combination, right? This is, yeah, definition of expectation of a function. And it is, no, suppose that, or suppose that, suppose that we have, so we are given two measures, but assume that difference of a particular function f under these two measures are quite large. So this is large, okay? okay. So here, sigma is the variance. So sigma is variance. Sigma square is the average of variance. Okay. Okay. So this means that there is a certain function f for which difference of expectation under two distribution is very large. If you can find a certain function f, if you can find this function f, then one can deduce that mu and nu are quite far away. Yeah. So this is quite useful. This is yeah quite useful to prove the lower bound because. Yeah, if you set new to be e yeah, stationary measure, so this is stationary, okay? And if mu is the distribution of time t mark chain, so you are comparing the distance between time t mark chain and stationary distribution. So we want to claim, I want to claim that stationary one and time t Markov chain one, they are not closed. They are not closed. I want to claim that. Then what should we do? Another way to prove this is that if you can find a certain function, some artificial function, such that expectation is very different, then you can automatically claim that total variation distance is already large. So this is the method of distinguishing statistics. So here the crucial business is that you need to find uh, this kind of nice particular function, which gives you a very different expectation. Okay. okay. So any questions? I will not prove this, but yeah, any questions about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. So of course this, yeah, this first theorem is the main, yeah, main result of this lecture, and yeah, the second one is not related to the mixing time, but this is also important in the sense that it connects the some kind of spectral information and the geometric information. So there is a relation between them. Okay. okay so we have thirty minutes, and yeah, so this is. Yeah, so this is the last part of the lower bound for the mixing time. So, yeah, so this, yeah, so, so for, yeah, so throughout the, this lecture course, I, yeah, I, disc, I, I briefly introduced a basic theory of Markov chain and 
how fast the Markov chain mixes and what is the what what are the tools to show the to to compute the mixing time, right? So we I explained some useful techniques to to prove upper bound or lower bound for the mixing time. So these are quite introductory tools. And from now on, so for yeah, 20 or 30 minutes, I will I will briefly introduce a new topic which is currently studied in the modern property theory. So yeah, there are some topics. Okay. Which are actively studied now. Okay. So mm -hmm. So there is an interesting phenomenon of cutoff phenomenon. So this is one interesting topic. So what does mean, this mean? Cutoff means that the this total variation distance. So this is a time, and this is the yeah. This is d. Okay. So recall that d t measures the distance between time t Markov chain and stationary. Okay. So mm -hmm. so we learned that in yeah in maybe second lecture we learned that. If we fix a state space and if we fix a Markov chain, then as t goes to infinity, this function decays exponentially fast. Okay, but there is a for certain Markov chains there is a cutoff phenomenon which sa which says that the total variation distance drops immediately. So it it decreases, right? Because we learned that. We learned this, right? So mu p minus u p u p decreases, right? So it always decreases. So it decreases, but at some time it decreases so fast, so fast, and then it decays like this. Okay. So there is a there is an abrupt abrupt de decrease in the total variation distance, and this phenomenon is called cutoff phenomenon, and this is verified for a certain class of Markov chains. So for example, so there is so many examples of this phenomenon. So the first example is lazy random walk on the hypercube. Okay. Lazy random walk on the hypercube. So it is known that Distance at time one half and low n plus some um, alpha n. Okay, it is known that this is less than one over square root of alpha. Whereas if you measure the distance at slightly shorter than this, okay, minus alpha n, so this is a slightly shorter time than this one, then this quantity is very large. So this is greater than 1 minus e power minus 2 alpha. Okay. So what does this mean? So this means that around this time, so around 1 half n log n time, okay, around 1 half log n time, if we measure the, yeah, if we measure the distance at alpha n earlier time this one, then Distance is quite large, but if we measure the distance after alpha n time, after than this, then distance becomes very small. So this means that around the time, around the time one half n log n, okay, around this time, there is a very fast decay in the function dt. So this window is of order n. Okay. Right. And recall that this window, O order F N window is very small compared to N log, right? Okay. So this is the example of cutoff. And there is another example, and I'll yeah, I'll explain one more. And second example. Okay. Second example is card shuffling. Okay. 
Okay, so we are mixing cards, right? So, we, hmm? so we are, we have n many cards and we we are mixing. So how how do we mix cards? So yeah. So we have n many cards. Okay, from top one to bottom one. Okay, and we pick the we pick a top card, top, top card, right? So we pick the, a top card, and then we put this card inside here randomly, and then we repeat this. Okay, so yeah, there's a a series of cards. Pick top one, put anywhere, and then pick top one, pick anywhere, top anywhere, right? So this is a Markov chain, right? So this is some kind of Markov chain on the permutation group SN, right? So we have n n factorial many configurations, right? Because there are n many cards, right? So how many configurations do we have? It is n factorial, right? So this is some kind of Markov chain on permutation group. And it is known that this Markov chain has a quota. So it is known that it's known that the distance at the time n log n. Yeah, so I would draw that graph. So instead of writing that, it is known that if you measure the total variation distance, then the graph looks like this. So the the distance decreases so fast at the time n log n, n log n, okay, around the n log n, okay, around the window of order n. So the this the location is slightly different. So in the case of la lazy random walk on the hypercube, there is a cutoff around one half log n. But if you think about this card shuffling, then there is a cutoff at n log. Okay. But the windows are the same order. It is of order O. It is of order n, right? Okay. And yeah, third example. So this is simple random walk on random regular graph. Okay. So what is random regular graph? So you know the regular graph, right? So regular graph is a graph whose degrees are same, right? So like this. So regular graph is this, like this. So, so H has degree three. Um, yeah. Yeah, like this. So if um, no, maybe what this is missing. Uh, this is three, 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 three. This is two. Okay. So this is three regular graph, right? Three regular graph. So three regular means that each degree, each vertex has degree three, right? Like this. So, but what is random regular graph? Random regular graph means that. We consider all possible regular graphs and then we pick randomly. So we so we consider so this is the some kind of uniform uniformly choose among regular graphs, D regular graphs. So there are, of course, yeah, and the size is fixed. Width, width, size is fixed. So if we fix the size of graph, and if we consider the collection of D regular graphs, then there are only finitely many regular graphs, and we pick randomly among them. So this is a, some of the uniform distribution among all possible regular graphs. So this is some kind of random walk on the random graph. Okay, so there are two randomness. So underlying graph is random, and we have another random walk on that. And it is known that this has a cutoff. So 
the there is a cutoff like this. So around the place, around the place d over d minus two log d minus one n, there is a cutoff of window root log n. And the last example is the elder schwenny graph. Yeah, so G and P. So this is Erdos Rennie graph. So what does this mean? This means that we so the graph size is n. So we have n vertices. Okay, so we have n vertices. And P is the edge probability. So for each edge, we include an edge with probability P. So pick this one. And with probability P, we put an edge. Okay. And with 1 minus P, we don't put an edge. Right? So like this. And for example, let's pick this one. And uh, of course, it, can, it may not be connected. Okay. And don't put this. And choose this and this. And with probability P, it is connected. And choose, for example, this and this, and it may not be connected with property one minus p, and so on, right? So it is some kind of random graph, right? So edges are connected randomly, right? And it is known that if we think about the simple random walk on this random graph, then this has a cutoff. So we have some kind of similar result. Okay. Okay. And and the last thing is the Particle system, interact particle system. Okay, so what does this mean? Particle systems. So we have the cycle Zn, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. So we consider the random walk, right? Before. So far we so for example, let's choose origin and with property one half, it goes clockwise. With property one half, it goes counterclockwise, right? But particle system is much more complicated than this. So instead of having one simple random walk, we have k many random walks. So we have one person here, second person, third person, and fourth person. Okay? So we have finitely many people on the circle. And each person follows the random walk, right? Each person follows the random walk like this, okay. independently. Okay. This, this, this. But the problem happens when they collide, right? So there can be some situation that, so after some time, so some time okay, pass, and there can be, so in two adjacent places, there can be two people, right? Person one, person two, right? This is possible, right? But it, for example, if we choose this, then it can jump to here. But this is not allowed. So it is not allowed that at the same position, there are two people. So that's not allowed. So if we have this kind of constraint, then this is some kind of, there is, this means that there are some kind of interactions. So although they do a simple random walk independently, there is some kind of interaction because there is a constraint that two people cannot collide. Okay? So this kind of system is called particle systems. And there, and, but in this kind of particle systems, it is very hard to prove the color. So in this case, it's very hard, a hard problem to compute mixing time and to have a color. Yeah, so yeah. This is currently interesting research problem nowadays. Yeah. Okay, so this is about the missing time. But the next question is about the. It is not about the heat missing time, but instead it is about the heating time. Heating time. Uh, 
and cover time. So what is this? Okay, so what is this? So there's terminologies, hitting, right? So hitting time is just the first time that Markov chain hits a set, right? So there is a set, this is a total set, and let's choose a subset, A, okay? And Markov chain starts from some point, okay? And if it moves like this, right? Okay. And one can consider the first time that Markov chain hits the set, right? So the, this first time is defined by the hitting time, okay? So this is the hitting time. And it is very important problem to, to yeah, find this hitting time, right? Because if you remember the problem set one, okay? So we define the notion of harmonic function. And the last problem, problem number six in the problem set one. So there is a nice relation between the harmonic function and the hitting time, right? So, so there are so many, so hitting time is very related to the harmonic function and yeah, like, yeah, so many concepts in the analysis. So it is very important to find and compute the hitting time for, for broad classes of Markov chains. And what is, but yeah, and what is the cover time? Cover time is the first time that Markov chain covers everything. Okay. So what does this mean? So cover time means that suppose that we have six many states. And the, there's a Markov chain, okay? Jumps to here, jumps to here, jumps to here. But it can go to the first time, right? This is possible. And go here, here. We want that this goes arrives the last point, but, but it may go back to here, okay? And go to here. But at some time, it covers the last point, right? So cover time is the first time that Markov chain covers all points. Okay. So cover time is the first time that cover time is the first time that Markov chain visit visits all points all states, okay? Yeah. So wh why is this important? So why, why do you study this? So this seems a bit artificial. So why is this important notion? So there, the reason is that there is a very nice relation between cover time and hitting time and mixing time. All of them are related. So one can bound a mixing time in terms of cover time. One can bound a mixing time in terms of hitting time. So all of these concepts are very related. So it is also very important to find the cover time. Okay. And so classically, it was very hard to find the cover time even for the lattice. For example, like this, right? Lattice. Okay. Lattice. So let's pick a torus of size n. Okay. Let's pick a torus. And if you think about the simple random walk on the torus of size n, what is the cover time? Okay. So this was very hard problem. And this conjecture was solved. And it is known that cover time is expected of cover time, right? So cover time is random, right? Because Markov chain is random, cover time is random, right? So expectation of this random cover time is given by 4 over pi n square log n square. Okay, so this is proved. Okay, so the proof is very hard. So, yeah, I don't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is so hard, yeah. And yeah. And there are also so many generations of generation of this for generalization of this. For example, what happens to the cover time on different type of graph? So what's the cover time of the random walk on the graph on the tree? Like this. 
So, yes. Of course, this is not fully solved. So for for general type of for general type of graphs, it is not known. Okay. And the last thing is. So far, I discussed only this discrete case, right? So discrete time, discrete space, only finitely many states, state space, right? So everything is discrete, right? But one can extend to, to this continuous version. So there is a continuous version. Okay. So what is the continuous version of simple random walk? It is, maybe some of you know, maybe it is called Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is a continuous version of simple random walk. So yeah, and mm -hmm. so yeah, what is this? So it's, so instead instead of lattice, we have a full Euclidean space. Okay, so for example, for example, let's think about R R two. So starting from origin, it behaves like this. Yeah. Okay. There is, this is a continuous process. And the important property of the Markov, sorry, in, important property of Brownian motion is that each time distribution is Gaussian. So at each time t, the behavior of the Markov Brownian motion is always Gaussian, so that's one important thing, and it satisfies the Markov property, yeah. So behavior of Brownian motion is similar to behavior of sim simple random. They, they are similar. And there's also generalization of this. So in this case, this is continuous pass, right? So there is no jump, it is continuous. And the discontinuous version is called the Levy process. So this means that process is no longer continuous. There is a jump. So this corresponds to the Laplacian. Laplacian. And this corresponds to non-local operator. Because there is a jump. Like fractional Laplacian. This is Laplacian. So yeah, so we know that the discrete version of Brownian motion is simple random walk. But what is the discrete version of Levy process? So what's the discrete version? It is not simple random walk, but okay. So in the case of simple random walk. We jumped or only to the adjacent points, right? So for example, if we are at this location, there are four many candidates, right? Here, 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 right? So this is the underlying reason why Brownian motion is continuous, because it only goes to the nearby points. But in the case of Levy process, it can jump to everywhere. Here, here. Here, so all jumps are allowed. So if you take the continuous continuum limit of this, then you will get a Levy process. Okay. So yeah, and yes, yeah, these two are very active topics now. So what is yeah? So what's the property of Brownian motion Levy process and connection to the partial differentiation equation? What's the regularity of the solution and so on? So there are so many. So many questions relate to this. Okay, so yeah, any questions about this?
Okay, so yeah. So mm -hmm. this is the end of lecture and yes, yeah, so anyway, um yeah. So yeah I discussed I brief yeah, so I briefly introduced the theory of Markov chains and and, and I mainly focus on the mixing time, not the other topics, but um, this is, yeah, of course, mixing, finding the mixing time is quite classical and old topic, but there are some, there are also lots of interesting questions which are not resolved now related to the mixing time. For example, how can we, how, so what's the mixing time for the particle system? And there are also interesting problems of that. and. Of course, there are different notions of different notions of times other than mixing time, like heating time, cover time, and so many other things. And there are yeah, so many interesting questions left in the theory of Markov chains. And yeah, this is quite also yeah active, still active topics in property theory. And yeah, hope you have some interest in that. And currently, now nowadays, I am not directly working on the Markov chain. So I work in different topics in property theory, not on the Markov chain, but yeah, I'm still interested in this and because there are so many interesting questions. So yeah, if you have, if you are interested in this Markov chain or property theory, then yeah, you can email me and then I can help you and yeah, how to study, yeah. Yeah, okay, so yeah, thanks for your, yeah. Thanks for attending my lecture course and hope you have a great time at KAIST until next week. Yeah, and yeah, see you. Yeah, thank you.